The Shell of Sense by Olivia Howard Dunbar It was intolerably unchanged, the dim, dark-toned room. In an agony of recognition, my glance ran from one to another of the comfortable, familiar things that my earthly life had been passed among. Incredibly distant from it all as I essentially was, I noted sharply that the very gaps that I myself had left in my bookshelves still stood unfilled that the delicate fingers of the ferns that I had tended were still stretched futilely toward the light, that the soft agreeable chuckle of my own little clock, like some elderly woman with whom conversation has become automatic, was undiminished, unchanged, or so it seemed at first. But there were certain trivial differences that shortly smote me. The windows were closed too tightly, for I had always kept the house very cool, although I had known that Teresa preferred warm rooms. And my work basket was in disorder. It was preposterous that so small a thing should hurt me so. Then, for this was my first experience of the shadow-folded transition, the odd alteration of my emotions bewildered me. For at one moment the place seemed so humanly familiar, so distinctly my own proper envelope, that for love of it I could have laid my cheek against the wall while in the next I was miserably conscious of strange new shrillnesses. How could they be endured, and had I ever endured them, those harsh influences that I now perceived at the window, light and colour so blinding that they obscured the form of the wind, tumult so discordant that one could scarcely hear the roses open in the garden below. But Teresa did not seem to mind any of these things. Disorder, it is true, the dear child had never minded, she was sitting all this time at my desk, at my desk, occupied. I could only too easily surmise how. In the light of my own habits of precision, it was plain that that somber correspondence should have been attended to before. But I believe that I did not really reproach Teresa, for I knew that her notes, when she did write them, were perhaps less perfunctory than mine. She finished the last one as I watched her and added it to the heap of black-bordered envelopes that lay on the desk. Poor girl! I saw now that they had cost her tears. Yet, living beside her day after day, year after year, I had never discovered what deep tenderness my sister possessed. Toward each other it had been our habit to display only a temperate affection, and I remember having always thought it distinctly fortunate for Teresa, since she was denied my happiness, that she could live so easily and pleasantly without emotions of the devastating sort. And now, for the first time, I was really to behold her. Could it be Teresa, after all, this tangle of subdued turbulences? Let no one suppose that it is an easy thing to bear, the relentlessly lucid understanding that I then first exercised, or that, in its first enfranchisement, the timid vision does not yearn for its old screens and mists. Suddenly, as Teresa sat there, her head filled with its tender thoughts of me, held in her gentle hands, I felt Alan's step on the carpeted stair outside. Teresa felt it too. But how? For it was not audible. She gave a start, swept the black envelopes out of sight, and pretended to be writing in a little book. Then I forgot to watch her any longer in my absorption in Alan's coming. It was he, of course, that I was awaiting. It was for him that I had made this first lonely, frightened effort to return, to recover. It was not that I had supposed he would allow himself to recognize my presence, for I had long been sufficiently familiar with his hard and fast denials of the invisible. He was so reasonable always, so sane, so blindfolded. But I had hoped that because of his very rejection of the ether that now contained me, I could perhaps all the more safely, the more secretly, watch him, linger near him. He was near now, very near. But why did Teresa, sitting there in the room that had never belonged to her, appropriate for herself his coming? 
It was so manifestly I who had drawn him, I whom he had come to seek. The door was ajar. He knocked softly at it. "'Are you there, Teresa?' he called. He expected to find her then, there in my room. I shrank back, fearing almost to stay. "'I shall have finished in a moment,' Teresa told him, and he sat down to wait for her. No spirit still unreleased can understand the pang that I felt with Alan sitting almost within my touch. Almost irresistibly, the wish beset me to let him for an instant feel my nearness. Then I checked myself, remembering, O oh, absurd piteous human fears, that my too unguarded closeness might alarm him. It was not so remote a time that I myself had known them, those blind, uncouth timidities. I came, therefore, somewhat nearer, but I did not touch him. I merely leaned toward him, and with incredible softness whispered his name. That much I could not have forborne. The spell of life was still too strong in me. But it gave him no comfort, no delight. Teresa, he called, in a voice dreadful with alarm, that in that instant the last veil fell, and desperately, scarce believingly, I beheld how it stood between them, those two. She turned to him that gentle look of hers. Forgive me, came from him hoarsely but I had suddenly the most unaccountable sensation. Can there be too many windows open? There is such a chill about. There are no windows open, Teresa assured him. I took care to shut out the chill. You are not well, Alan. Perhaps not, he embraced the suggestion. And yet I feel no illness apart from this abominable sensation that persists, persists, Teresa, you must tell me, do I fancy it, or do you, too, feel something strange here? Oh, there is something very strange here, she half sobbed. There always will be. Good heavens, child, I didn't mean that. He rose and stood looking about him. I know, of course, that you have your beliefs, and I respect them. But you know equally well that I have nothing of the sort. So don't let us conjure up anything inexplicable. I stayed impalpably, imponderably near him. Wretched and bereft though I was, I could not have left him while he stood denying me. What I mean, he went on in his low, distinct voice, is a special and almost ominous sense of cold. Upon my soul, Teresa, he paused. If I were superstitious, if I were a woman, I should probably imagine it to seem a presence." He spoke the last word very faintly, but Teresa shrank from it nevertheless. "'Don't say that, Alan,' she cried out. "'Don't think it. I beg of you. I've tried so hard myself not to think it. And you must help me. You know it is only perturbed, uneasy spirits that wander. With her it is quite different. She has always been so happy. She must still be. I listened, stunned, to Teresa's sweet dogmatism. From what blind distances came her confident misapprehensions! How dense, both for her and for Alan, was the separating vapour! Alan frowned. Don't take me literally, Teresa, he exclaimed, and I, who a moment before had almost touched him, now held myself aloof and heard him with a strange, untried pity newborn in me. I'm not speaking of what you call spirits. It's something much more terrible." He allowed his head to sink heavily on his chest. If I did not positively know that I had never done her any harm, I should suppose myself to be suffering from guilt, from remorse. Teresa, you know better than I, perhaps. Was she content, always? Did she believe in me? Believe in you? when she knew you to be so good, when you adored her. She thought that? She said it? Then what in heaven's name ails me? Unless it is all as you believe, Teresa, and she knows now what she didn't know then. Poor dear, and mine's... Mine's what? 
What do you mean, Alan? I, who with my perhaps illegitimate advantage saw so clear, knew that he had not meant to tell her. I did him that justice, even in my first jealousy. If I had not tortured him so by clinging near him, he would not have told her. But the moment came, and overflowed, and he did tell her. Passionate, tumultuous story that it was. During all our life together, Alan's and mine, he had spared me, had kept me wrapped in the white cloak of an unblemished loyalty. But it would have been kinder, I now bitterly thought, if, like many husbands, he had years ago found the story he now poured forth some clandestine listener. I should not have known, but he was faithful and good, and so he waited till I, mute and chained, was there to hear him. So well did I know him, as I thought, so thoroughly had he once been mine, that I saw it in his eyes, heard it in his voice, before the words came. And yet, when it came, it lashed me with the whips of an unbearable humiliation. For I, his wife, had not known how greatly he could love. And that Teresa, soft little traitor, should in her still way have cared too. Where was the iron in her? I moaned within my stricken spirit. Where the steadfastness? For the moment he bade her, she turned her soft little petals up to him, and my last delusion was spent. It was intolerable, and none the less so that in another moment she had, prompted by some belated thought of me, renounced him. Alan was hers, yet she put him from her, and it was my part to watch them both. Then, in the anguish of it all, I remembered, awkward, untutored spirit that I was, that I now had the great recourse. Whatever human things were unbearable, I had no need to bear. I ceased, therefore, to make the effort that kept me with them. The pitiless poignancy was dulled, the sounds and the light ceased, the lovers faded from me, and again I was mercifully drawn into the dim, infinite spaces. There followed a period whose length I cannot measure, and during which I was able to make no progress in the difficult, dizzying experience of release. Earthbound, my jealousy relentlessly kept me. Though my two dear ones had forsworn each other, I could not trust them, for theirs seemed to me an affectation of a more than mortal magnanimity. Without a ghostly sentinel to prick them with sharp fears and recollections, who would believe that they would keep to it? Of the efficacy of my own vigilance, so long as I might choose to exercise it, I could have no doubt, for I had by this time come to have a dreadful exultation in the new power that lived in me. Repeated delicate experiment had taught me how a touch or a breath, a wish or a whisper, could control Alan's acts, could keep him from Teresa. I could manifest myself as palely, as transiently as a thought. I could produce the merest necessary flicker, like the shadow of a just-opened leaf, on his trembling, tortured consciousness. And these unrealized perceptions of me he interpreted, as I had known that he would, as his soul's inevitable penance. He had come to believe that he had done evil in silently loving Teresa all these years, and it was my vengeance to allow him to believe this, to prod him ever to believe it afresh. I am conscious that this frame of mind was not continuous in me, for I remember, too, that when Alan and Teresa were safely apart and sufficiently miserable, I loved them as dearly as I ever had, more dearly, perhaps, for it was impossible that I should not perceive in my new emancipation that they were, each of them, something more and greater than the two beings I had once ignorantly pictured them. For years they had practiced a selflessness of which I could now scarcely have conceived, and which even now I could only admire without entering into its mystery. While I had lived solely for myself, these two divine creatures had lived exquisitely for me. They had granted me everything, themselves nothing. For my undeserving sake their lives had been a constant torment of renunciation a torment they had not sought to alleviate by the exchange of a single glance of understanding. 
There were even marvellous moments when, from the depths of my newly informed heart, I pitied them. Poor creatures, who, withheld from the infinite solaces that I had come to know, were still utterly within that. Shell of sense, so frail, so piteously contrived for pain. Within it, yes, yet exercising qualities that so sublimely transcended it. Yet the shy, hesitating compassion that thus had birth in me was far from being able to defeat the earlier, earthlier emotion. The two I recognized were in a sort of conflict, and I, regarding it, assumed that the conflict would never end, that for years, as Alan and Teresa reckoned time, I should be obliged to withhold myself from the great spaces and linger suffering, grudging, shamed, where they lingered. It can never have been explained, I suppose, what, to devitalized perception such as mine, the contact of mortal beings with each other appears to be. Once to have exercised this sense-freed perception is to realize that the gift of prophecy, although the subject of such frequent marvel, is no longer mysterious. The merest glance of our sensitive and uncloyed vision can detect the strength of the relation between two beings, and therefore instantly calculate its duration. If you see a heavy weight suspended from a slender string, you can know without any wizardry that in a few moments the string will snap. Well, such, if you admit the analogy, is prophecy, is foreknowledge. And it was thus that I saw it with Teresa and Alan. For it was perfectly visible to me that they would very little longer have the strength to preserve near each other the denuded impersonal relation that they and that I behind them insisted on, and that they would have to separate. It was my sister, perhaps the most sensitive, who first realized this. It had now become possible for me to observe them almost constantly. The effort necessary to visit them had so greatly diminished, so that I watched her, poor, anguished girl, prepare to leave him. I saw each reluctant movement that she made. I saw her eyes worn from self-searching. I heard her step grow timid from inexplicable fears. I entered her very heart and heard its pitiful, wild beating. And still I did not interfere. For at this time I had a wonderful, almost demoniacal sense of disposing of matters to suit my own selfish will. At any moment I could have checked their miseries, could have restored happiness and peace. Yet it gave me, and I could weep to admit it, a monstrous joy to know that Teresa thought she was leaving Alan of her own free intention, when it was I who was contriving, arranging, insisting. And yet she wretchedly felt my presence near her. I am certain of that. A few days before the time of her intended departure, my sister told Alan that she must speak with him after dinner. Our beautiful old house had branched out from a circular hall with great arched doors at either end, and it was through the rear doorway that always in summer, after dinner, we passed out into the garden adjoining. As usual, therefore, when the hour came, Teresa led the way. That dreadful daytime brilliance that in my present state I found so hard to endure was now becoming softer. A delicate, capricious twilight breeze danced inconsequently through languidly whispering leaves. Lovely pale flowers blossomed like little moons in the dusk, and over them the breath of mignonette hung heavily. It was a perfect place, and it had so long been ours, Alan's and mine. It made me restless and a little wicked that those two should be there together now. For a little while they walked about together, speaking of common daily things. Then suddenly Teresa burst out. I am going away, Alan. I have stayed to do everything that needed to be done. Now your mother will be here to care for you, and it is time for me to go." He stared at her and stood still. Teresa had been there so long, she so definitely to his mind belonged there, and she was, as I also had jealously known, so lovely there, the small, dark, dainty creature in the old hall, on the wide staircases, in the garden. Life there without Teresa, 
even the intentionally remote, the perpetually renounced Teresa, he had not dreamed of it. He could not so suddenly conceive of it. Sit there, he said, and drew her down beside him on a bench. And tell me what it means, why you are going. Is it because of something that I have been, have done? She hesitated. I wondered if she would dare tell him. She looked out and away from him, and he waited long for her to speak. The pale stars were sliding into their places. The whispering of the leaves was almost hushed. All about them it was still and shadowy and sweet. It was that wonderful moment when, for lack of a visible horizon, the not yet darkened world seemed infinitely greater, a moment when anything can happen, anything be believed in. To me, watching, listening, hovering there came a dreadful purpose and a dreadful courage. Suppose for one moment Teresa should not only feel, but see me. Would she dare tell him then? There came a brief space of terrible effort, all my fluttering, uncertain forces strained to the utmost. The instant of my struggle was endlessly long, and the transition seemed to take place outside me, as one sitting in a train motionless sees the leagues of earth float by. And then, in a bright, terrible flash, I knew I had achieved it. I had attained visibility, shuddering, insubstantial, but luminously apparent. I stood there before them, and for the instant that I maintained the visible state, I looked straight into Teresa's soul. She gave a cry, and then, thing of silly, cruel impulses that I was, I saw what I had done. The very thing that I wished to avert I had precipitated. For Alan, in his sudden terror and pity, had bent and caught her in his arms. For the first time they were together, and it was I who had brought them. Then to his whispered urging to tell the reason of her cry, Teresa said, Francis was here. You did not see her, standing there under the lilacs, with no smile on her face? My dear, my dear, was all that Alan said. I had so long now lived invisibly with them. He knew that she was right. I suppose you know what it means, she asked him calmly. Dear Teresa, Alan said slowly, if you and I should go away somewhere, could we not evade all this ghostliness? And will you come with me? Distance would not banish her, my sister confidently asserted. And then she said softly, Have you thought what a lonely, awesome thing it must be to be so newly dead? Pity her, Alan. We who are warm and alive should pity her. She loves you still. That is the meaning of it all. You know, and she wants us to understand that for that reason we must keep apart. Oh, it was so plain in her white face as she stood there, and you did not see her. It was your face that I saw, Alan solemnly told her. Oh, how different he had grown from the Alan that I had known. And yours is the only face I shall ever see again and again he drew her to him. She sprang from him. You are defying her, Alan, she cried, and you must not. It is her right to keep us apart if she wishes. It must be as she insists. I shall go as I told you. And Alan, I beg of you, leave me the courage to do as she demands. They stood facing each other in the deep dusk, and the wounds that I had dealt them gaped red and accusing. We must pity her, Teresa had said, and as I remembered that extraordinary speech and saw the agony in her face and the greater agony in Alan's, there came the great irreparable cleavage between mortality and me. In a swift, merciful flame, the last of my mortal emotions, gross and tenacious they must have been, was consumed. My cold grasp of Alan loosened and a new unearthly love of him bloomed in my heart. I was now, however, in a difficulty with which my experience in the newer state was scarcely sufficient to deal. 
how could I make it plain to Alan and Teresa that I wished to bring them together, to heal the wounds that I had made? Pityingly, remorsefully, I lingered near them all that night and the next day, and by that time had brought myself to the point of a great determination. In the little time that was left, before Teresa should be gone and Alan bereft and desolate, I saw the one way that lay open to me, to convince them of my acquiescence in their destiny. In the deepest darkness and silence of the next night, I made a greater effort than it will ever be necessary for me to make again. What they think of me, Alan and Teresa, I pray now that they will recall what I did that night, and that my thousand frustrations and selfishnesses may shrivel and be blown from their indulgent memories. Yet the following morning, as she had planned, Teresa appeared at breakfast dressed for her journey. Above in her room there were the sounds of departure. They spoke little during the brief meal. But when it ended, Alan said, Teresa, there is half an hour before you go. Will you come upstairs with me? I had a dream that I must tell you of. Alan, she looked at him, frightened, but went after him. It was of Francis you dreamed, she said, quietly, as they entered the library together. Did I say it was a dream? But I was awake, thoroughly awake. I had not been sleeping well, and I heard twice the striking of the clock. And as I lay there looking out at the stars and thinking, thinking of you, Teresa, she came to me, stood there before me in my room. It was no sheeted spectre, you understand. It was Frances, literally she. In some inexplicable fashion I seemed to be aware that she wanted to make me know something, and I waited watching her face. After a few moments it came. She did not speak, precisely. That is, I am sure I heard no sound. Yet the words that came from her were definite enough. She said, Don't let Teresa leave you. Take her and keep her. Then she went away. Was it a dream? I had not meant to tell you, Teresa eagerly answered. But now I must. It is too wonderful. What time did your clock strike, Alan? One, the last time. Yes, it was then that I awoke. And she had been with me. I had not seen her. But her arm had been about me and her kiss was on my cheek. Oh, I knew. It was unmistakable. And the sound of her voice was with me. Then she bade you too? Yes, to stay with you. I am glad we told each other. She smiled tearfully and began to fasten her wrap. But you are not going now, Alan cried. You know that you cannot now that she has asked you to stay. Then you believe as I do that it was she, Teresa demanded. I can never understand, but I know, he answered her. And now you will not go. I am free. There will be no further semblance of me in my old home, no sound of my voice, no dimmest echo of my earthly self. They have no further need of me, the two that I have brought together. Theirs is the fullest joy that the dwellers in the shell of sense can know. Mine is the transcendent joy of the unseen spaces. End of The Shell of Sense by Olivia Howard Dunbar